Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Is the mic on? I'm going to talk to you a bit about privacy applications. Um, First, we'll start by defining what privacy, applica privacy applications are. When we talk about internet privacy applications, we talk about systems that can introduce a measurable amount of privacy to a user's system. They do things like conceal, conceal information about the user, allow the user to determine what information he gives up and what information he protects. It restricts access to information that a user determines is private. It may conceal the user's identity if it's so an anonymity system. And privacy applications prevent unauthorized third parties from monitoring users' activities on a network. <coughs> Some examples of privacy enhancing technologies are encryption protocols such as PGP, S-MIME, various disk encryption programs. VPNs that use IPsec or other VPN variants, and start TLS in mail, SSL in uh, TLS and various other applications, most notably web browsing. Other forms of pets are local computer security measures, cookie managers, privacy policy enforcement programs, firewalls that exist on a local user's machine, credentials and digital wallets, and then there's anonymity services, which exist to hide the identity of a user and disassociate his actions with, a, uh, with his name. There's anonymous remailers, which do higher latency message anonymity, such as Mixmaster and the new generation of remailers, Mixminion. There's web proxies. Anonymizer is, is a, one example. The uh, Java anonymous proxy is another. And then there's IP level anonymity, onion routing, Zero knowledge and freedom are examples of that. Talking about the existence of privacy applications presumes that users actually want privacy. So that's the question that anyone designing such a system needs to first ask. Do users want privacy? Well, in order to ask that question, you need to define to a user what privacy is and what their threats are. Most of the risks users face, um, credit card fraud is one that's brought up a lot. The risks there are generally small because of agreements they have with their cardholders and such. Identity theft, stealing a user's identity credentials in order to conduct business or gain uh, privileges on a network by pretending to be them. A lot of these privacy threats are addressed sufficiently for users' concerns through legal means. Privacy applications exist so the user can, through technological means, ensure his privacy without having to rely on, on laws. Consumers do have the ability to analyze what their threats are and what measures they need to take to protect them. They can do threat analysis. They don't realize what they're doing when they determine that it's too expensive to buy a privacy application or too difficult to use it, but they know how to do trade-offs. A little bit of history here. When PGP first hit the news and hit the internet community, this was a promise for a golden age of privacy. Users were expected to jump all over encryption for their home computers, encryption for the average person. A number of other privacy technologies were discussed in the public for the first time in some places. Um, academic ideas such as eCash, anonymous voting, anonymous remailers were now being talked about as something that every individual could have. There were a group of programmers that came out of the San Francisco Bay Area who believed that leveraging anonymity and privacy technologies would allow for world peace, uh, would put 
control of an individual's liberties, civil liberties, and rights in his own hands and protect him from big businesses, governments, anybody who posed a privacy threat. And they believed in creating programs to give to the masses so that they would be able to take control of privacy into their own hands. Well, that all sounds very good, but 10 years later, we don't really have much in the way of usage of privacy applications. On the face of it, it looks like people don't care. However, if you look at the actual successes, that paints a different story. SSL and TLS have become pretty much ubiquitous. Almost all online uh, e-commerce transactions are done over SSL. There are a large number of mail servers which implement SSL on the links. People accept and even now demand that websites be secured with a digital certificate. But when we look at stronger privacy applications, such as PGP, um, other email encryption protocols, such as S9, PEN, MOS, and a few others that nobody ever uses, disk encryption, or anonymity services, we find that usage is limited usually to people that are highly technical or interested in cryptography themselves. So we're talking about a very small uh, section of the internet population. Privacy applications all hinge on the ubiquitous availability of anonymous digital cash. And as anyone can see now, that hasn't happened. There is no anonymous digital cash. The technology for it is feasible, but it doesn't exist. And I will stand up here and say that it will never exist. I'd love to be proven wrong. So we have really poor usage statistics for anonymity systems. Why is this? It's not because users don't care about their privacy. If you ask any person on the street, do you want privacy on the internet? The answer is almost certainly going to be yes. So the real question comes down to, why aren't you using this software if you really want privacy? It's not usable. Well, it's not usable is not an answer that most cryptographers or software developers traditionally have bought, because they can use it. You can use your Unix program with your long string of commands to encrypt your files. You can spend hours waiting through window configuration files to set up PSEC, but that doesn't meet the threat analysis for the users. They view privacy invasion as an abstract threat. It would be nice to have protection for privacy, but the cost associated with either purchasing or downloading a free product spending hours learning how to use it, setting it up, and then convincing the people they're going to communicate with to do the same has a cost associated with it. It's time, it's energy, and it doesn't balance out with the perceived threats. Why don't we have usable crypto applications, privacy applications? A number of possibilities. Users simply don't care. Developers don't know how to design products that can be used by the masses. Or they're very good developers, but they don't realize who they're developing products for. A number of crypto programs that have provided utility to the public have simply been projects of grad students or hobbyists who have wanted to put their, their interest into practice and develop the program to demonstrate their, their abilities or to try out new cryptographic uh, possibilities without really intending for a wide audience. So they're designed not for the audience that ends up using them in, in, in the end. Um, then there's the whole class of problems where privacy applications are designed with a heavy political influence, either from law enforcement agencies, corporate marketing <laughs> reasons, or other political ramifications 
during the 90s, the United States had a uh, crypto export regulation which limited the strength of cryptography. So many privacy applications were written with workarounds to that coded in, which made it more difficult to use the applications. But take any one of these as the real reason behind it. It doesn't really matter which is causing the problems in usability in your privacy application. The real question comes down to, can this be fixed? Is usability just simply an unsolvable problem when it comes to privacy applications? Is it impossible to make cryptography usable by the people? The main problems people would talk, try to distribute privacy applications and encourage their use is, first of all, lack of perceived need. You ask that person on the street, do you want privacy? The answer is yes. Next question is, how far are you willing to go for it? You'll get to mixed answers there. Are you willing to spend five minutes to install a program that will just make you private? Are you willing to spend $30 on a program? 300 Are you willing to spend an hour? two hours a day. Very quickly, the answer becomes no. There's also the problem, the single fact machine problem. If I want to use email encryption, not only do I need to decide I'm going to go through whatever process necessary to get email encryption available to me, I also have to have people that I can talk to. If I'm encrypting my mail, but the people I communicate with don't speak that protocol, don't have that software, don't have the ability to read the mail I'm encrypting, it serves me no purpose and I can't use it. Lack of forced adoption. Sometimes, particularly in companies or bureaucracies, the only way to get a security policy in place is to mandate it. The same goes with privacy. The only way to get privacy technologies in place in many companies is to determine this is the corporate policy, everyone must behave this way. We're finding that companies often are very happy to come up with policies that really have no bearing on technology, but are more about when documents need to be shredded, who can be shown what, where passwords can be kept. Passwords are a, a great corporate policy uh, section. There's Every company has some varying policy, often many varying policies, depending on which system you're logging into, about how long passwords can be, where they can be posted, when they have to be changed. All of this is really useless in practice, but looks very good in security policy papers. However, when it comes to actually encouraging people or requiring people to use technology which does increase their privacy, we're not seeing co companies really pushing this. And when we are seeing them, we're seeing problems in deployment. A well-known company which produced email encryption software had a corporate policy for doing key exchange, which was fundamentally broken. They couldn't even get their own employees to use their own product well. It's a fairly common problem that the people dictating policy don't really understand the technology that they're discussing. That problem can be, blame for that problem can be placed on the people dictating the policy for not doing their homework, but also on the designers of those products in that somebody needs to actually put work into determining how that product should be used before they can tell their employees how to use it. Lack of availability has been a problem. I mentioned the crypto export regulations. We're recovering from that, but there are still problems where technology and security companies have had their international sales hindered by past problems with trade and crypto between, com between countries. So we're still recovering from that. And then there's interoperability. If you have one company deciding to go with one standard for cryptography and another company going with a completely different standard or the same standard but a different implementation of it that doesn't work, it becomes very frustrating very quickly for the users when they are ostensibly using the software in the proper manner but still unable to communicate. Often, there's a problem where backwards compatibility is obsessed about. And when a protocol changes, great effort is put into making sure that the new protocol can speak to the old protocol. This sounds like a good idea initially, but in practice has led to a number of major problems where 
actually breaking backwards compatibility would have made the transition easier in that there would be a common ground. People would know this version will not be with that version. I must upgrade rather than transient interoperability errors that we'll discuss later. Now, when we have a user who decides, I want privacy and I'm willing to spend time on it, where do they stop? Where do they give up? User interface, actual UI design of client application, that is a big issue. You cannot simply write a security program, privacy program, which implements crypto, does everything you need to do to make it secure, but then doesn't have a way for the user to intuitively interact with it and use it properly. Standards bloat. When you have an encryption standard, which is supposed to be an open standard, which other vendors, third parties can read and then write a com compatible program based on that standard, you need to make sure that the standard is easily implementable and does what it is supposed to do in every single compatible implementation. If you have two implementations, which are both by the letter of the standard compliant but can't speak to each other, that is a problem with the standard itself. Developers often have the mentality when they're designing protocols or designing privacy applications that if they can't achieve perfect security, if they can't have the best possible and theoretical solution to protecting privacy that their product is aiming for, then it isn't worth doing that product that sacrificing on security in the name of usability is not an option. What they don't really consider, however, is that if a product is so unusable by virtue of being so secure, it is really not secure at all because nobody is going to use it. If I produce a email encryption program which is resistant to just about every known attack on email encryption programs but is so difficult to actually get people to use because the interface is broken or the concepts that they need to understand before they can be using it are too complica complicated to explain to them, they won't use it, which is effectively giving them zero security. Again, this all needs to be solved in the user interface. There are some areas where cryptography and privacy applications have improved. Places where users didn't expect good UI. The military is obviously a, a good example because cryptography has already been used there so and UI has already been bad. If we can improve the cryptography, they're already using it, they're already forced to use it, they have no choice. Improving the math does improve their privacy. Some companies, banks for instance, that have used Encryption have also benefited from improvement in the field of encryption if they're already using it and already accepting and managing with bad UI. This fundamental problem in security design, threat analysis, and creation of privacy applications that users don't end up using I think can be summed up by a recent interaction that a notable cryptographer had when he decided to dabble in the field of locksmithing. Locksmiths have been designing locks and protecting physical security for many, many years. They understand their customers, they understand how to do threat analysis for their customers, and they know that trying to sell their customers an unbreakable lock, a super secure system, that is out of their affordable price range renders them less secure because they will not choose such a system. They will instead go with whatever weaker system they can find. Locksmiths have figured out how to analyze what a user's needs are and provide them with a solution which will address them. When this cryptographer discovered a problem, in quotes, with master keying systems and discovered, in quotes, a well-known attack against it, he basically condemned the locksmith community for not having published this information and scared users needlessly. 
we do that. That's commonplace with cryptography. That's commonplace with privacy applications. Cryptographic systems developers, security people are very, very good at explaining the extreme risks to the end user in an attempt to get them to use secure systems possible. What ends up happening isn't that people will come and jump on your privacy application. What they will do is they will do the trust analysis in their head. They will do the threat analysis in their head. They will say, okay, there's some nebulous force that is monitoring all of my email, watching everything I do, and I, this is why I need to use cryptography, which nobody can break. Gee, that's nice to know. I've never seen any indication of this, and I don't see any threats about what I'm sending. So I'm going to ignore it completely. The real solution is to get something that they can use and that they can associate some sort of value with. If you give them a risk which is completely unknown to them, they're not going to take it seriously. It is fine to strive for per perfection in the security systems when you're dealing with theoretical attacks, when you're proposing new research which is not going to be actually be implemented for some time. There is a place for this, just as there is a place for this in physical security. But when it comes to actually providing a solution to end users being a vendor, developers need to be aware of their audience and aware of what exactly the problems that they're trying to solve are and if they fit with the problems that users want to solve. Some of the problems we've seen with protocols have to do with committees being part of the design. We find that protocols end up being overextended. They try to do more than their initial scope because everybody wants something different to be done. And it would be nice if you had one protocol which could address all the needs of people that have similar interests. However, if you add additional functionality to the protocol, you end up making the protocol much more difficult to implement, much more difficult to audit, and much easier to implement correctly in an incompatible fashion with other correct implementations. Mistakes are harder to catch, harder to debug, harder to analyze. An alternative, which isn't really being done that much in crypto and privacy protocols, is to, instead of adding more functionality to the protocol, create specific protocols which serve the needs of one problem. They address one problem, provide one solution, and then in your, pro in your application level, add multiple protocols. If you want to have a program which does five different things, instead of trying to find a protocol which addresses all those five things, have a program implementing five protocols. That is not a problem. That is easy to isolate where incompatibilities are, it is easy to manage, and it is much easier to have a protocol which can be easily implemented by other parties because if you're an implementer who doesn't need what four of those five solutions are, you can implement the one protocol which does what you need. Another big pitfall with protocols, particularly the IETF, but a lot of other bodies like the idea of putting multiple algorithm choices into a protocol. PGP, for instance, has a choice of CAST5, triple DES, IDEA, AES, TwoFish, and Blowfish as symmetric key encryption. The rationale behind this is that if one of those protocols is broken, all of the users of that system will go and open up PGP, select the preferences pane, which gives them a list of allowed cipher choices, will disable the broken one, will then delete all of their self-signatures on their key, re-sign their keys with the new protocol, distribute their keys back out to everybody they talk to, and then those people who still may be using the old program that allows the, uh, the broken uh, cipher will now know that they shouldn't be doing that and they'll be secure again. Obviously nobody's going to actually do that. Not only are there so many ways in which that process can be mishandled, it's also just simply absurd. 
Additionally, adding in multiple ciphers gives you more possible ciphers that could be broken. If you have a protocol which does three different cryptographic algorithms, you've now increased your chances of having that cryptograph one of those cryptographic algorithms broken by three. PGP also has three different public key ciphers and I think four different hashes. So you have a wide smorgasbord of different crypto algorithms to attack if you're trying to attack. There's also a problem of having weak ciphers in your system and having to support them in the future. Fmime suffers this. Fmime V2 allows 40-bit symmetric encryption. This was done, of course, to make it so that Fmime clients could be shipped out of the, uh, the US. And subsequent versions of Fmime have backward compatibility support with the versions that allowed 40-bit crypto. There is a way to disable accepting 40-bit crypto, but that doesn't stop somebody from sending you mail encrypted using a 40-bit cipher and having it broken on the way to you. Can't really control what the person you communicate with is doing. So the alternative here is real protocols that have single well-selected algorithms for their purposes. One metric cipher, one public key encryption algorithm, one hash. What if they're broken? Well, you design your protocol so that they can, the protocol isn't tightly tied to that algorithm. You can drop in a new algorithm to replace it if necessary. But you do this in a protocol version rev, and then that gives you the benefit of immediately breaking back with compatibility with the old version. This is desirable because if those old versions are truly broken, you want people to switch off of them as soon as possible, and you want people to stop communicating with people using the old versions as soon as possible. I'm going to pick on PGP. I, can I take questions at the end? Or I'm going to pick on PGP a bit, uh, not because I think it's the worst attempt at privacy. In fact, it's one of the best. But simply because it could have been so much better. PGP in the early days was touted as the crypto protocol for everyone. And when it first came out, it was aimed mostly towards hobbyists. I got my first version of PGP in 1992, downloaded it off of the CDF, and off. The usability of that program didn't really change over the next five years. Later, it got a Windows UI, which also requires heavy knowledge of cryptographic terminology in order to use. When you have notable personalities, such as Peter Griffin, who worked on PGP2, saying, I get one piece of PGP encrypted mail every month or two, Adam Shostak, who is here again and honored that I'm quoting, talking about his mother, who can't even get his parents to use this protocol when he is a bona fide cypherpunk. Tim May, founder of the cypherpunks, who brought cryptographic privacy solutions to the forefront of the internet consciousness, saying that he rarely encrypts. One of the authors of the IETF standard for, or RFC for OpenPGP, saying that it has architecture problems. We realize that there is some sort of problem with the design of PGP. It comes down to, first of all, what is PGP's purpose? When I talk to people about PGP, they don't know what I mean. They don't know if I mean the protocol, the program, and what part of the program, the part that encrypts mail, the part that is a firewall in VPN, which just happens to bear the name of PGP, or is it the disk protocol? In the disk program, PGP, once you get into it and start using it, you're assaulted with terms like public key, private key, symmetric key, algorithm, cipher, hash, armor, signature, valid, invalid. All of these are vocabulary that it's familiar enough to the end user to get confused, but unique enough to 
the security community that they really need a glossary of these terms in order to figure out how to use PGP. In fact, PGP ships with a manual which explains the history of public key crypto and how it works and has a glossary for terms like validity. This isn't a science fair project for most people that want to use PGP. They don't want to sit down and have an undergrad course in the, an intro to pub, public key crypto. They want privacy. They want to encrypt their mail. They want to make it so that nobody can read it. This is the level at which we need to design these programs. Part of the problem, and this comes down to striving for perfect security instead of giving people something better than what they have, is the idea that you need every component of a security system in order to get some benefit. Yes, it is true that if a security system is weak in one point, it may subvert the entire security of the system. However, just because you have a weak point in your security system doesn't mean that you should do everything else securely. SSL, for instance, when a user is using a browser and encounters a website that doesn't have a VeriSign certified root or another trusted certificate, will throw lots of scary messages to the user. We'll tell the user that you are encountering an invalid certificate, an expired certificate, an untrusted third, signed by an untrusted third party, all kinds of horrible, scary, ominous messages. But we'll happily allow that same user to go to the website using HTTP colon slash slash, thus avoiding such scary messages. SSL would probably be encrypting a large majority of web traffic on the net today. Processors can handle lots of SSL connections. There's no reason not to be using that as our primary web browsing protocol, except that there's a tax on this. In order to avoid all of those scary messages from your browser, you have to pay lots of money to VeriSign or an equivalent and get a certificate to make people not have to do those learnings. Of course, the actual benefit from authentication is far, far less than the opportunistic encryption that SSL makes available to us, since most of the attacks on your average user's web surfing and, and web information transmission are going to be passive attacks. They're going to be sniffing, monitoring. It's rare that somebody is going to actually, an average user is going to fall under an active attack either by a man in the middle with a web server targeted attacks against them. So given the nature of reality here that active attacks against your average person are much less likely than passive attacks on the web, one would want to design a system that addressed the passive attacks first and the active attacks when possible. However, it's not as much money in that for VeriSide, so we have convinced people that they can't have encryption without authentication. PGP also suffers from this a little bit, sort of as a byproduct. There's no one selling PGP certificates, so there isn't such a financial motivation to spread FUD about unauthenticated encryption. But we have this whole concept of the web of trust in PGP, which encourages users to go out and be their own CAs, certify other people, verify their identities, so forth, with the hope that this will be a ground-up, grassroots distribution of trust. And PGP likes to throw warnings when you have a key that's, that's not trusted or a signature which is signed by a key that you haven't verified yourself. But this isn't as as significant a problem as it is in SSL because it is mainly the only problem with SSL adoption that I see currently that, that's worth noting. In the RFC 2440, the Open PGP Protocol specification, RFC 1991 is covered as well. RFC 1991 is an informational RFC about the PGP2 protocol. PGP is a protocol designed for interoperability based on PGP 5. These are two completely separate, different ways of doing PGP. PGP, as defined in 2440, referred to as V4, 
is has a lot of benefits from experience learned on PGP2 and solved many of those problems, but has a it's crippled because it has many workarounds for interoperability with 1991. This seems rather unintuitive to me, given that a PGP application could implement RFC 2440 without having to worry about backwards compatibility with 1991 and could have implemented backwards compatibility with V2 in the application, but the application really spoke, spoke two protocols. There is some necessity for crossover there when it comes to doing key certification between two different keys. That's easily handled. SSH addressed the SSH version 1 to version 2 switch in a fairly similar fashion to what I'm proposing here. And it worked out fairly well. I talked about the problem of having multiple symmetric ciphers. This is intensely prevalent in PGP. I'm fearing when one of those ciphers is and they will have to start over with a new protocol. But there's also the problem of having multiple hash algorithms. As PGP is implemented, currently if you can find a collision that occurs in one of the hashes that's supported, you can possibly attack PGP. By having multiple hashes, you've pretty much brought the system down to the weakest hash, instead of giving yourselves alternatives in having more secure hashes if one is weakened. When we're dealing with anonymity systems, there are an entirely additional set of considerations, one of which is hiding identifiable, uh, identifiable aspects about the user. You may be protecting his name, but if you're giving up information about which email client he's using, which web browser he's using, which anonymity service application he's using, you are giving up information about him, and an attacker can then look at the various data that's that he has analyzed from the anonymity system and narrowed down people into different groups based on what email program they're using and so forth. So if you add protocol extensions, you're giving more room for identifying factors so that if somebody is using an anonymity system which is based upon a protocol such as PGP, they possibly have risk there if an attacker can determine that they're using a specific version of PGP or using a specific interoperable 2440 implementation, for instance. We see this actually as a real problem in the type 1 remailer system. The idea that you can have a protocol which will scale to whatever a user's threat model is based on protocol preferences that are defined by the user is also a dangerous way of thinking. If a user sets preferences in his key or in his message, but then must rely on his correspondent to actually have a program which will honor those preferences, he's basically extended his trust to that user's system and that user's application. Now, you do that to some extent with any bit of encrypted communication where you're sending data to somebody else and he's going to read it on his system, but you don't want to be doing this intentionally. You don't want to be doing this willingly. Back to the problem of S-MIME with its version 2 with weaker ciphers. There is a way in F509 to specify extensions that you can then mandate the, that a cipher not be used. But many implementations, such as a large software company out of Washington, just simply discard these packets because they're too difficult to, to process. There's too many uh, different possible fringe cases. So just use it, just encrypt to it. Often these risks aren't necessarily apparent to an end user when they go and install the software. Remember, end users are expecting that a piece of software that advertises it provides privacy to do just that. It says, We have a privacy application, we protect your privacy. They will expect to install it and have that work. They're not going to think through all the possible different attacks against that. That's what we're paid to do. One of PGP's biggest features is the web of trust. This idea that 
one would go out and certify his friend's keys, be his own certificate authority, and then be able to connect to anybody else's, uh, talk to anybody else on the internet by tracing the web of trust between him and them is fundamentally flawed. PGP actually doesn't provide that utility. What it is is a web of assertions. I certify that I know Bob. Bob can certify that he knows Alice. I haven't certified that I know Alice. So if you're looking at my key, you really have no path to Alice. You simply have assertions that aren't trust transitive. Aside from that problem in, in semantics there, we have an issue with the web of trust becoming a major learning curve problem in PGP. People have to sit down and not only do they have to understand the concepts of public key, private key, and digital signature, they also now have to understand what it means to certify somebody else's key and get their head around this whole web of trust idea. You've added more complexity to the problem to the program without really providing any more security or any better solution to what you're trying to solve. If we're going to be designing privacy programs, which really do provide privacy for the users, that do protect their information, conceal their identities, provide them confidentiality in their communications, and so forth. We need to sit back and think again. What are the security threats? A major security threat is that a system will not be used, or it will be used incorrectly. These are as valid security threats as any other. They aren't secondary concerns. In fact, they are primary concerns. If you cannot design a system with a friendly UI or that can be used without major learning curve and time, effort, training expenditures, if your audience isn't some special case like the military where people can be forced to learn these things, you aren't really giving a solution. You're just giving another problem. What we need are systems which don't explain public key cryptography. They can give the user public key cryptography, but they shouldn't rely on the user knowing how to use public, knowing what public key crypto is in order for it to be used correctly. I have a BMW. I drive my BMW. I like it. It's stick. I know how to use a stick, and I've opted to learn that because I like driving it. My mother has an automatic car. She likes that. I don't know really what's going on inside the engine there. I'm not really a car person outside of the driver's seat. Yet if I wanted to, I could sit down and take apart my engine. I don't need to know how combustion engines work. I don't need to know how a block brake work. These are buzzwords that I can let fly over my head if I want to. It doesn't impact my ability to drive. The same sort of philosophy in designing privacy applications needs to be used. If somebody wants to sit down and examine the source code to figure out how padding is being done in a, a protocol that does perfect forward secrecy. They can sit down and do this by looking at the code or analyze an open protocol. But to then put that in a user's manual and try to explain to them the math behind digital signatures, how, try to explain to them exactly how hashing works in a way that, that is secure, you're going to lose your audience. And they're going to believe then that this system that you are so eloquently explaining to them in mathematical terms is too complicated and furthermore overkill for what their threats are and they won't use it. You need to simplify the concepts. You need to put them down into the level of this is a steering wheel, you use it to turn your car. This is a brake pedal, you push it to stop. One click usage is a really good goal. Not only do we have the problem of, well, if we can get people to understand how to use the software, it'll work, but also, even if I had a bit of program, a, a piece of software that would install easily and be intuitive, if a user has to go through many more steps to do what is effectively the same thing he's been doing all along, sending email, for instance, he may not do it. If I'm a user who has a mild interest in protecting my privacy, but doesn't really see any major threat or downside to not using an encryption program. 
I'm not going to go too far out of my way every time I send email to employ this encryption program. Having a minimum or a maximum of one additional click when you are doing the process of sending email or web browsing or whatever the privacy application may be addressing is probably within somebody's time budget, but more than that may not be. Better integration into the underlying application goes along with this. If I'm using an email program, I want my email program to continue working the way it always has. I just want privacy salted in there. So I'm not going to want to have to fire up a separate program to do my encryption, do my privacy work, and then bring it back to my email program. And I'm certainly not going to want to have to switch email programs. So what I will want is an email program for other general purpose applications, which can have privacy added to it without really getting in my way. There also should be absolutely no room for error. If you have a system which does not need to be explained, you have to eliminate possibilities that it can be used improperly. The main reason for needing to explain how to use PGP today is that people, if they don't understand the concepts, may misuse it without realizing. Eliminate the ability to misuse a program, you also eliminate a lot of the explanation necessary. And then I will take a stance that says, even though I'm saying simplify these things and hide the underlying mechanics of the system from the user, those pieces of it still should be able to be examined by interested parties. I won't use a crypto program that I can't be certain works, even if I don't want to be consciously aware of what it's doing every time I interact with it. There have been some attempts at addressing these usability problems. PGP, aside from usability snafus, is really a decent crypto system. They've gotten a large number of the security issues under uh, settled, and it pretty much does what it advertises as far as actually providing secure email. So PGP, if it were used as an underlying email encryption protocol with a better user interface, could possibly provide people somewhat the usability that they want. Hushmail is a web-based Java applet mail server system which uses the OpenPGP protocol and allows people to compose email in a web browser, send it and have it be encrypted if, if possible, and sent in the clear if not, without really having to even tell the user what's going on underneath of it. They don't even know that they're using PGP unless they go and read the FAQs, which aren't necessary to start using the program. There's a company named Zendit, which is working on a similar type of system, only what they do is they have a plugin which overlays on top of Hotmail and Yahoo Mail and so forth that intercepts text to some extent and opportunistically encrypts it using PGP. Then there is a system known as Lockmail, which does the encryption on the server using PGP, but has a similar user interface. Of course, that's less secure because you're then trusting the server instead of trusting your local workstation, but of course, provides more security than Hotmail by itself. Other possibilities when it comes to mail encryption, uh, we could come up with a new open PGP protocol that eliminates this overabundance of different algorithms that serve no real purpose. It could cut backwards compatibility with the older version so that people would have a leaner, more focused protocol. Or we could look at doing an entirely different protocol. If applications which don't have to interoperate with any other applications besides themselves want encryption, there's no reason why they can't just have their own specifically designed protocol. Trillion, which is a very popular multi-instant messaging client for Windows, has in it opportunistic encryption. Unfortunately, it's not on by default. You have to dig through a number of preferences to find it. But once you do, it simply does a TLS negotiation and gives you AES encryption um, when you're chatting with somebody. It isn't authenticated, but as I said before, most of the attacks that people are probably concerned about are passive monitoring and not active attacks. 
there is another protocol proposed by some researchers at Berkeley, referred to as off-the-record messaging, which has a number of uh, promising attributes that improve its security over PGP, and it is designed with the idea of simple lean protocol in mind. I'm not even sure if they had listed that as a design goal, but this is how it turned out. So they, they designed that pretty impressively. I haven't seen it actually implemented anywhere yet, but it would be nice to see something using that as, pos as possible alternative to PGP. And there's Start TLS. Start TLS is TLS in, or SSL, in SMTP. As deployed currently, most, in, most deployments don't require signed certificates. They just will simply happily do opportunistic encryption with any other mail server that speaks start TLS as mail is being transferred using the femoral Diffie-Hellman session so that there's perfect forward secrecy on the line and you're protected against most passive, well, passive attacks and a number of active attacks are made more difficult The problem with Star TLS is that it does the link encryption for the mail servers. It's not client to client end to end encryption. So a user is trusting his mail server and trusting that something won't happen to his mail on the way to that mail server, on the way to the recipient mail server to the client. But this is far better than simply open in the clear sending of mail across the internet because most passive attacks that we would see against somebody's mail system are probably happening after it leaves the network control. On the point of active versus passive attacks with encryption systems, not, I'll get back to uh, SSL again for a moment. Not only are passive attacks most likely the most common attack we're seeing against this. But active attacks are far harder to protect against and aren't adequately protected against by the current systems which introduce lots of measures to try to protect against them. Anybody who remembers the VeriSign certificates which were issued from Microsoft a few years ago uh, to somebody who wasn't even affiliated with Microsoft can realize that every effort we've taken to prevent active attacks by doing authentication in these protocols, which are really for encryption, have not actually served that much benefit and have simply done more harm than good for the amount of usability problems and barriers to deployment that they've caused. A new OpenPGP protocol, if it were to be designed, should strive to eliminate the legacy issues cut loose the old protocols that don't need to be supported anymore and are simply causing headaches. Of course, correct all the existing flaws, which we couldn't have known about when we first designed it, but we discovered over time. Have single algorithms. Get rid of this parameterization. Red herring. Add in backwards compatibility if necessary at the, at the application level, not in the protocol could be very similar to OpenPGP currently, so that developers wouldn't have to relearn a new protocol and would behave consistently with existing implementations. And they'd probably be able to use some of the same libraries and APIs. If we're going to look at application-specific privacy, our requirements become much less. We don't need to implement anything more than exactly what is needed for that application's needs. We can design simple protocols for specific purposes within the application and within the requirements of the application's users. And we can have adoption immediately. If you're designing a program and you want to add in privacy to it, you can make that the default. You can make that ubiquitous throughout the entire system, and you will be certain that it's being used. All the concerns about interoperability with outside systems with other implementers go away. Now, this, of course, hinders you in some aspects. When I use Trillium on my Windows machine, I'm not able to set up an encrypted session with somebody using 
AOL's message, cl message client, for instance, but I do know that I have an easy to use encryption proto protocol with other Trillion users. It actually benefits Trillion because a number of my friends have switched <coughs> to Trillion with my prompting um, because I wanted their privacy features. Same time is a Lotus message client which talks to AOL as well as same time surfers. It implements a protocol very similar to what Trillion does, I believe. Unfortunately, Trillion and same time don't speak to each other. So there is a lot to be said about having protocols that are open that other people can implement. But the other aspect of this is if the choice is learn how to implement a large bloated protocol and then do interoperability tests with everybody else or leave privacy out. Many developers will go with the leave privacy out. It's not a big concern. So I would like people to start using, start adding a third option into that bit of choices, which is get us privacy for our users first. Design a system that we know we can manage, we know we can implement, that will work. Off the record messaging done by a number of people at, at Berkeley and a zero knowledge employee. Uh, improves on PGP with protocol secrecy in the system. It allows reputability. Many users really don't want to be having all of their email messages signed because they want to be able to deny what they're saying. However, you do want authentication so that the problem comes down to how do I know that I'm talking to the right person in a way that that person can then, to a third party, deny what he said. They've solved this problem in OTR. People interested should read the paper. This is nice because it could be deployed over existing instant message systems today if they chose to implement it. And UI issues are trivial to address in a one-click fashion. I've just covered Star TLS here a little ahead myself, but the issue here is it's zero cost to the end user. They don't see it at all. It has nothing to do with their client, their software, and they get the benefits of having mail server to mail server encryption without having to do any work whatsoever. What would be ideal is if we could move that model to a client to client end to end system so that there are not points of attack on the network. We still don't address the active attacks, man in the middle, other ways of, of subverting a system if you really want to, but we do eliminate the passive attacks. So, if somebody wants to design a privacy system that people will actually use, it will actually have measurable benefit, they need a system which has a UI with no manual necessary to use it. It should be software that you can install, run, and figure out. You could even make the argument that it needs to be able to be presented in an icon-only fashion. Click this and you get a lock. Now you're secure. Words imply that you are trying to convey some kind of large concept that needs to be understood. We want to eliminate that. Make concepts simple, make them intuitive. Do not require the user to figure out how to use public key crypto when all they want is privacy, even if you're giving them that public key crypto. You should require no more skill than a basic email program. If somebody is trying to implement privacy or add privacy to their email system, they don't want to have to learn how to use something that's more difficult than what they're doing already. It should be less difficult and not make their interaction more obtrusive. Inconveniencing the user is a sure way to get them not to use your product. And I'm big on the one-click bit. I think that if users have to go through a large number of drop-down boxes or select many different choices when they're picking keys, they're probably, even if they have the software installed and say they use it, not really going to use it often. So I have 15 minutes, I think, for questions. Adam had one. Oh, excellent. about the encryption applications and what about this 
Um, I can talk at length about that because I'm a developer of an anonymity system. Um, what we're seeing with anonymity systems, so the, the issues of usability being security considerations are even more so in anonymity systems. When you have an anonymity system that relies on being able to confuse an observer by having more users than they can track, we refer to this as the anonymity set, your security is largely improved as you get more users. Right now, there are a number of different ways of doing anonymous email. Using sending email from Hotmail, for instance, is anonymous email. If your name isn't attached to it, you can post the forum there anonymously. Of course, that's easily trackable if somebody were to subpoena Hotmail records. Then there's systems like Anonymizer, which allows you to register with them, and they don't keep logs linking real names to accounts. You trust them not to keep logs. They're a proxy. They just work. And then there's strong systems like Mixmaster, which is an anonymous remailer uh, mixnet implementation, which, is, which makes it impossible for any one remailer operator to know the identity of his users, even if he wants to. However, while from a technological and mathematical point of view, Mixmaster is more secure than Anonymizer, if you look at the number of users Anonymizer has versus the number of users Mixmaster has, the actual effective anonymity provided may be greater in Anonymizer because they have users a number of order, orders of magnitude larger than the other systems. Why do they have those users? It comes down to usability. They're very easy to use. You sign up with them. You can, you can use your, you can use their web browser proxy to connect to Hotmail and send mail from Hotmail there. If Hotmail tries to figure out who you are, they come up with an anonymizer IP, and there are no logs there. Simple. The concepts are very simple. It's very easy to explain. It takes no effort to really learn how to use it, and it just works. So we are looking at for the anonymous remailer network and Mixmaster, designing a way to have a layer that does the anonymity operations necessary to work with the system, but at the same time hiding the end user. What we really want to work on is a system which will allow users to use the email client, but act as a shim between the email client and the outside world. Um, again, I don't have to explain to people what a mixnet is or how public encryption works, etc. Just tell them this works, this is what the experts say works, trust it. If you want to learn more, here's where you go to learn more, but here you can start using it today. Are there any other? The anonymizer services aren't they required by law to keep some tracking of the user that they're providing services? I think that's what happened. Um, I don't know. The past few years have been interesting in the U.S. as far as anonymity goes. Um, currently, we haven't seen anything that's a significant threat to that at this point, but I can't say that we won't. Um, anonymizer, I'm not sure if Anonymizer keeps logs for a short period of time or not, but the main thing is they don't have any database that links their users to their, their users to their real names. And to my knowledge, there isn't any law which requires that. I didn't really look at freedom too much because I was skeptical of doing anonymity systems at that level. Um, I've been told that the UI in Freedom wasn't that bad. Um, Adam can actually probably answer that better, but uh, since he works there. Um, 
few words, sure. Adam's talk tomorrow. Other questions? kind of surprised by the silence on behalf of many people in the security community about the flip side to those promises, which are the implied threats. I think there are a lot of possible dangers with going down a route where trusted computing systems are, are necessary for access to the internet, for instance, which is the next logical step in, in, in a system like that. And that's a, that's an entirely separate talk, actually. But I would like to know why so many of my colleagues are silent on this matter. They do, have, they do offer potential benefits, but the question comes down to, are those benefits worth the associated risks? Any other questions? There's two parts to that. One is, what's a good, a good UI? One the user doesn't see. It doesn't get in their way. It doesn't exist. So designing a UI starts you down the wrong path already. What you want to do is try to hide as much as possible from the user interaction. Now, that's not possible in many different, in many examples of privacy applications. You need a UI to control what you're doing. In software companies that are doing this professionally, they should be hiring user interface experts. They should be doing studies on usability to make sure that what they've proposed actually works. When you're, so that's, that's a problem which is easily solvable and, and isn't being solved due to uh, ineptitude and incompetence by those companies, uh, I will say. However, when it comes to smaller startups that don't have the budget to do that sort of thing or um, internal products being developed for instance, a company where they don't want to spend that much money or open source projects, it becomes more difficult. As I would like to see, so a number of good privacy applications have come out of universities. They've been people's PhD research, they've been undergrad projects, and they demonstrate that they're done for the purpose of demonstrating that a, a theoretical solution to a problem can actually, actually be implemented and deployed, the primary concern isn't getting people to use it, but proving to their PhD advisor that what they're doing actually works. So it would be nice to see in universities, for instance, collaboration between groups doing user, human interaction with computer research, UI design, and such, so that instead of having a crypto pro uh, application which does something wonderful but isn't usable, and a great UI that demonstrates how to pick up red balls and blue balls in a room with a robot serving a practical purpose. Uh, it would be nice to have these groups collaborating so that in the end, the results of their work can actually be used. Um, now for the lone open source hacker working on a privacy application to fight the man and save the world, um, 
they have, of course, whatever resources to make themselves available to them. So it would be nice to start seeing people such as this appealing for UI expertise. I don't see many privacy application developers in the open source area standing up and saying, OK, we need to think about UI. We need to ask people to help us with our UI. Often they tend to think that their UI is good enough because they're blinded by the fact that nearly everybody using a computer doesn't want to see a command line. Any last questions? Thank you.